Very thrilled to see our guests, Tiffany Hosley and Nika Sun Chong with us in the live chat. Thank you so much, both of you, um, for getting up early, for joining me here on the show. Uh, there's so much I have in the way of questions following up on the program. But first, you, what, what did you think? Did you enjoy the show? Um, thoughts, comments? I know it's always tricky to, to look at yourself, um, but I think you were fantastic. And I hope that everybody in the world watches the program. Um, Tiffany, what do you reckon? How'd you do? Um, I was a little nervous watching myself. I think I could have did better, but I think for the most part, everything was okay. I just want to say that is such a girl response. We <laughs> women always think that we can do better. And, and most of the guys we have on the show said, I thought I was really good. You're <laughs> pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, totally with you. Um, I like the group support as I watch it myself. What about you, Nika? How'd we do? Well, I thought it was wonderful. I, of course, always love hearing from participants and seeing Mayor Brown and Mayor Tubbs uh, talk about the history of guaranteed income. Again, it's really refreshing and great context for Tiffany and, and Rosalind and Kaisha. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it makes me very proud to be able to bring your story to um, 250 million households across the, across the country um, and into Canada, not to mention social media and on radio. So um, I think it will advance the discussion nationally. As we talked about it in our team and as we did promotion, one question came up that I'd love you to um, just answer if you can. Nika, um, in the piece, Mayor Brown distinguishes between universal basic income and guaranteed basic income. Can you help us understand those differences? Sure, so guaranteed income is more of an income floor below which people can't fall. Universal basic income, even though this hasn't really been tried in countries other than Mongolia and Iran for a couple of years in 2011, it's the idea that every single person who's a resident or citizen in a country should have a basic income, which is around $1,200 and that this is regardless of their, um, you know, their employment status or their current um, income or wealth. And this is really something that is really controversial. And I'm excited that guaranteed income is in a way a stepping stone to universal basic income. Have you found people had questions about the Compton Pledge since you became a, a recipient of it, Tiffany? And what are their questions? But I'm assuming one question is, how do I get one? <laughs> Yes, one of the most questions that I'm frequently asked is, how did this happen? How did you become a part of this? Who did you call? You know, they're, they're uh, questions about the, the chain of events which led up to this. Um, another question that I'm frequently asked is, is it real? Were you paid to do this? Like, who, who paid you to answer these questions or, you know, things like that? A lot of people are a little hesitant because, every you know, a lot of people are getting these emails, but they're assuming that it's a scam because, you know, of the questions that's asked there. So I think that that's the most questions that I'm asked all the time is who, how, when, and where. Yeah, well, the, the how I think is really important. And I would love you, I don't know whether you've ever had experience of applying for any other kind of benefit. I know I've tried to apply for unemployment at different times. Um, and I've seen people go through hell trying to get any help at all, even help they were utterly uh, entitled to. Uh, also, just not knowing what help is out there seems to be a major, keeping the information from people who need it seems to be a major kind of project of many of our um, city and state programs and federal programs too. Can you compare the experience that people have applying for other benefits to the Compton Pledge, Tiffany? I would say that the process is a lot more, um, it's a lot easier and it's a lot more informative. The people that work behind the scenes with the Compton Pledge, they're very informative. They're very helpful. Um, if you had any concerns, they're addressed within a timely manner. If it's any, um, you know, maybe bumps in the road as far as getting the information that you need or answering the questions, there's, there's people there and they make you feel like a human. You're not looked at or frowned upon for being in the position to need the help or um, being in the position to just you know, I just think more than anything, you're treated like a person. You're treated with dignity and respect. And that's not something that we always run into in other avenues. Yeah, I mean, Nika, you treat people like a people. You know, it's it's um, maybe a low bar, but it's actually a very high bar. And, and I have to just, you know, share the info that while we were doing our interview with Nika, the phone rings and Nika picks it up as we encouraged her to and says, hi, Compton Pledge, and let me get your help. And you could tell the guy on the other end of the phone was like, 
whoa, you're a real person. Um, so that, it, it does strike me that the, it seems as if the mission of much of our other sorts of benefit provision is to keep the money from getting distributed. Um, and, and I guess government budget cutters, as I said in the chat, do kind of reward people who don't spend the money. Isn't that, am I, am I overemphasizing the contrast, Nika? I think it's true that a lot of government programs, you know, this idea of efficiency and cost savings and reducing fraud, it's all about, um, you know, ultimately ensuring that people don't have the money. And at the Compton Pledge, we're so excited to talk to participants. We're excited to deliver this cash. And we have a great team, it's a small team, but we've had over 5,000 conversations and our average waiting time is 90 seconds. And if our team can do this, we're not government officials, we really hope to inspire government to look at these numbers, to look at this program, to look at the results and the way it's impacting amazing people like Tiffany and say, how can we do this? If they can, we can. Yeah, I mean, I've often heard in philanthropic circles, this question of is something scalable? Is your project scalable? And what I'm hearing from you and what I heard in the show from Mayor Tubbs was, it's not necessarily about taking this program national, independently funded, philanthropically funded, but rather catalyzing some new policy at the level of government. Do I have that right, Nika? Yeah, I think it's true that we shouldn't look too specifically at particular programs to necessarily scale them across the whole country because we're so diverse as a country. At the same time, I think there are elements of our program that can be scalable. So we have a payments platform, we have a customer service platform, we have the ability to choose between Venmo, PayPal, direct deposit or prepaid debit card digitally, which is really important during COVID when you need to access services remotely. And I think because of that technology, this, there are elements of the Compton Pledge that could be scalable to the whole city, to the state, and hopefully to the country. Well, those are some of the questions that are coming in. Maria on YouTube is asking, you know, can we get the program? Now, I don't know where Maria is, but um, how are other cities and communities getting this program? And um, that map that we showed, that isn't all Compton Pledge model initiatives, right? So there are 50 mayors who are part of a consortium called Mayors for Guaranteed Income that are implementing or advocating for a guaranteed income program. At the Compton Pledge, actually since Mayor Brown um, spoke and gave the interview, we've enrolled our full 800 participants. So we have the 800 households receiving money and around 1,770 beneficiaries, including children, um, families of those participants. So we are fully enrolled but we certainly hope that in the future, this program sets the standard for future programs as those 50 cities really roll out their initiatives. And we should say, you, you, mar you marked a great milestone this week, um, okay. right? Do you wanna tell our audience about it? And then Tiffany, I have more questions for you, but this was a big, a big week for the Compton Pledge, as it turns out. It was so exciting. So we announced this week that we enrolled our 800th participant, and um, this has been a huge feat of our incredible team, really making sure, as Tiffany was saying, that. People know that this isn't scam, that everybody's getting their first payments on time. So we announced that we have dispersed over a million dollars so far. And starting in December, we've enrolled people until April 6th when we are fully enrolled and fully functional. So a million dollars gone out there. Tiffany, are there any stories beyond your own that you want to share or any more of your own stories, um, your own story uh, since we did the recording about the impact the pledge has had? Um, as far as I'm concerned, nothing's changed. It's all it's all been the same. Um, so I haven't encountered any anything else that I would want to share. But it's just been a, a positive process through the whole I mean, time. I, you move me to tears when you talk about having to run to the water company. You know, I, I don't think people should be having to run to the water company to stop water being cut off. But I did report from Detroit where that was exactly the story. Um, this question of water cutoffs is a crisis all across the country. How close were you? How scared were you? Um, and what would that have meant to have the water cut off? I believe that was Rosalind who had the um, water concern. It, it wasn't me. Oh, I'm getting confused here. But when I heard that on the show here, I was like, nobody should have to go through that. That is right. a, a make or break for people. Um, I totally and the agree. Fact that, and it shouldn't, I mean, I think it should come with all the other taxes that we pay. Uh, but I do think that that question of, 
what do we consider basic services also comes into this conversation. The commons, the basic provision of basic services shouldn't be all commodified that we're paying a private company. Um, I don't know whether you have had that conversation in the context of the pledge, but um, do you think people that are interested in the commons can get jazz to the pledge too, Tiffany? I believe so. Um, that hasn't been a conversation that I've been privy to, but I do believe just from my own personal perspective that it would be so, yes. And Nika, that group of people that are getting involved in this, do you think? Because it's a fairly distinct group, but very active and interested, especially since 2008, Occupy Wall Street, among others, brought up some of those questions. Absolutely, and I think it really relates, Tiffany, to part of the story that you shared, that you know, paying for medicine, $900 for one medicine, $300 for another medicine, out of pocket because it's not covered by insurance, that's another example of where government is failing us and where we need to reimagine social insurance, um, social assistance, and think about what we deserve as individuals, not because we're working, not because we are proving particular requirements, but because we're residents of this country um, and the government works for us. Yeah, I think just having the words guaranteed and basic out there is, is important right now. Any questions you have for each other or for the program? Um, we've got some folks watching live. This conversation will be posted uh, throughout the week. Anything you want to add that you perhaps left out or invitations that you want to make to people who might be finding out about the Compton Pledge for the first time? Tiffany? No, I think we kind of covered all those bases on the initial interview. I think the one thing that I would like for everybody to know is that Compton is an amazing place. Like it's definitely different from the depiction that's being put out to the world. We're, we're put out as to be, you know, a, a group of less than um, people who don't want anything. And I just think that the whole dynamic needs to be changed because that's not the truth. We're a, a family-based area. You know, uh, a lot of people who are here have hearts and goals. You know, we all have ambition and, and different things like that. And I just think that for more than anything, we need people to stop judging us for what they've heard and learn us for who we are. And I just think that, that the Compton Pledge is one of those ways that helps get the narrative out of the people that are here in Compton. It's, it's not all of what it's made out to be. It's a whole lot more in a, in a positive realm. Nika? I have a question for Tiffany. So we were actually talking yesterday, me and Tiffany, about the narrative change that can really you know, happen because of initiatives like the Compton Pledge. Um, and Tiffany, I'd love to hear from you if you've seen any of that happen so far in the couple of months that we've been live with the Compton Pledge. I do. I believe that um, the whole dynamic is changing. A lot of people are looking at things different. A lot of people are looking at it for the fact that not only did we survive through a pandemic, but we survived within our organization with help from within, be it um, a sister or a brother, you know, a franchise or different things. It's just the fact that everyone's coming together to try to grow and uplift each other to the next level or to the next element of life, I think that it's great because it shows that these things were already happening in the city, but the, there are things that were being ignored. Now these things, the light is being shined on these situations with which opens the doors for other companies or other cities to look at it. If Compton can do it and we're looked at right. to be the, the bottom of the barrel, so can we, so can I. I think that it gives people motivation to promote change. So I think that it's a good thing. Yeah, I'm getting one question via Twitter, which has to do with, you say that the pledge is structured in such a way as to make sure it's accessible to undocumented people and formerly incarcerated people. Can you give us even a, a brief example of how you do that? What makes your process different to ensure those folks are included? Sure, so there's no application process is one. Um, for undocumented residents. We don't require a social security number. We also don't require ITIN. So to receive our prepaid debit card, you can choose for safe in-person pickup at Sherla. You could also uh, just enter a mailing address where you would like us to mail you the card. So we don't collect any personal information. And I think that's really something that we try to clarify on our payments portal and something that really builds trust among participants. And Sherla is? The Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights LA, one of our partners. So having partners in the community is another part that we didn't get into in this show, but I think is super important. 
that it's not like you parachute into a community and set something up like this. You created a network or you, you tapped into a network that existed. And Tiffany just talked about it in terms of the mutual aid efforts that have kept people alive. Um, do you want to talk a bit more about some of the partners, either one of you, maybe Nika kick off and then Tiffany, who has been your, your cohort as you made this happen? Sure. So I attribute a lot of the success of this to Mayor Brown, who is an incredible leader and also has incredible connections to the community. We have a 20 person Compton Community Advisory Council, which really informs and designs elements of the program. They beta tested our payments portal and they ask us questions. They give us feedback and they really act as strong spokespeople throughout the community when residents do get those questions. Um, you know, I got this email, is it's a scam? I can look to my pastor, I can look to um, the head of this nonprofit, I can look to a teacher, a resident, people who I know are involved in the initiative and who I know in real life, and I can ask them and they can talk to me about any questions I might have that I might not be comfortable asking um, on, on an email or something like that. And that's been one of our real, real key ingredients to success. Tiffany, you wanna add? Um, I think just to piggyback off what Nika said, it would be the same, just the fact that we have the, the um, provisions to go to different, the, one of the, the big factors in our city would be the Salvation Army, the church, you know, different things like that. So just to know that we have that accessibility readily available is a good, it's, it's a good feeling. So first map your community. Yeah. See who's already there. Um, I would include <laughs> media in that. Have local media helped? I'm not in, in any way that I've been involved. I think that it will probably be a better question person to ask that question. <laughs> well, maybe we can guilt them into it or, or prompt them into it. How about that? Okay. Um, a couple of questions on the on the uh, YouTube and then we'll, we'll let you both go. And I thank you so much for getting up early on the West Coast. Um, one is, uh, are we suggesting anything like a universal basic services model? <clears throat> I guess that, that comes out of the discussion about water. And then, um, what did it take uh, or, or, or what did it take sort of to persuade people to go for this model at the, lay, at the level of, of city government? Um, Nika, you want to start? Sure. So absolutely. Universal basic services and access to services are incredibly important, especially during COVID when you see increased um, need to rely on government services. But we don't we don't really assume that that is at the cost of also advocating for universal basic income. I think it can be both, not just either or. And then what it took to advocate for guaranteed income or to implement this in Compton, I think, um, you know, we saw from the show today that there has been such interest from mayors across the country. So this is not something that we convinced Mayor Brown to advocate for. It's a real partnership between two different organizations and people who really um, on their own thought that this was the future. This is a policy whose time has come. Tiffany, did you do advocating out there? Um, I think that more so it would be amongst friends and you know counterparts, different things like that. I won't say that I've been out in the community advocating for it. However, I have, um, you, you know, amongst those that I, I interact with, um, other children, other households, different, you know, scenarios like that, church members, things of that sort, yes. Well, finally, I think there is the question of politics. And at the very beginning of our chat, there was a guy on there saying, oh, this is just, you know, pie in the sky, um, hopes, putting, putting out hopes there that will never be fulfilled by the Democratic Party. Um, it's all just about keeping Democrats on the hook for the midterms. I didn't hear anything actually about midterms or the Democratic Party in today's show, but I do have a question, Nika, as to whether you're getting interest at the federal level, whether you feel that there is any kind of um, likely action at the level of the Biden administration or people you know, working with the Congress. Um, what's happening at that level, do you know? Yeah. We certainly hope so. And I think with the American Rescue Plan, there is this renewed interest in um, direct cash to people. But what we're saying is that we think that should be recurring and not just only in a time of a pandemic as emergency relief, that now that we're building the infrastructure and also building the political will across the aisle to implement this policy, it's time for a more deep uh, and more concerted effort to really explore what universal basic income implementation would look like moving forwards. And that's something that's not new to this country but maybe this moment can really make it happen. Tiffany, you're nodding. I totally agree with you, Um, I, I definitely do. 
I, I think I look at it this way, that we, if they open a little door, which the American Rescue Plan seems to have done, we need to do everything we can to jam our feet and maybe our whole body into that open door and, and expand it what more widely. If, if we can do that with a TV show and radio show and podcast, we will. And we know that you will be out there in, in, in Compton. So thank you both so, so much for being with us on the show and in this chat. Uh, we will do more to promote this this week and in the weeks to come. And I hope that everybody who is watching or who spreads this to their friends um, knows that you're really helping to advance this conversation. And we look forward to seeing what comes of it. Nika, Tiffany, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Bye. Thank you, Nika.